Well, let's once again pray to our God as we turn to his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come today to focus our hearts and minds and our attention on this, your word. We pray, O Lord, that it would accomplish that for which you sent it, that our we would be attentive to your word, that our hearts would be open, that our minds would understand, and that the Spirit of God would take this word and, and do a great work in the hearts and lives of all of us who are here this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we are not going to be turning to 1 Kings in chapter 21. We will resume there again next week. As I came to Friday of this week, and I had been studying and kind of putting things together from 1 Kings 21, I came to a point in time on Friday night where I just was unsettled. And in my unsettledness, I was wondering why it was that I felt that I wasn't going to, shouldn't preach from 1 Kings 21. And as I was pondering this and meditating on it, this scripture from Acts and chapter 8 came to my mind, and so this morning I want to preach to you from Acts and chapter 8 and set our attention on the second half of this chapter this morning, this conversion of the eunuch from Ethiopia. Now here in this text, we are given truth that is of infinite value to us. We have something that is more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold. For here we have an account of the converting work of God. How it is that God can take a man like this Ethiopian eunuch, a, a successful man, a, a powerful man, an influential man, a religious man who was yet living in darkness, who was not a Christian, who was not converted, and how God in his grace and his mercy works to bring him to salvation. Here we have an example of the work of God through the preaching of the gospel, how men and women, sinners, can come to know and be reconciled to God, converted and brought into his kingdom, taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his everlasting light. Brothers and sisters, this is the greatest need in our land today. This is the greatest need of all who are here this morning, that we would be saved, that we would have a work of God done in our hearts and in our souls so that we might come to know and be reconciled to the God who made us and sent his son to save us. Because each one of us, someday, our life is but a vapor and then it will be gone. And the great question is, will be, what have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God provided for your salvation? And brothers and sisters, this is the great commission, the great task that the church has been given to accomplish. We have been set by the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the gospel of salvation to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, that through this message, which is the power of God unto salvation, men and women would come to be reconciled to God and saved through the work of Christ. And yet what I find when I listen to messages from churches across our country, you can go online now and hear so many what they're preaching, and what we find is that Christ is so often absent. So many other Truths from the Bible will be taught. People will be taught how they can have a good marriage, how they can work, how they can do various things, how they can live a good life, and so on. And yet Christ and his blood, Christ and his cross, Christ and the work that he has accomplished, so many of them are silent on this issue. Do you want to know what is the problem in our country today? The problem in our country is that the gospel is not sounding forth from the people of God and from the pulpits of our land, and so people haven't been changed, haven't been converted, haven't been saved. Unsaved people live the way we are living today. A country apart from the gospel will live in darkness and sin. And so it is our job, our task, that to preach this gospel, because it is this gospel that can transform dark cultures like ours. This is exactly what happened in the first century Roman Empire. 
What we find in the book of Acts is that the apostles and the people of God were laser focused on this one thing. They were called to be witnesses, to proclaim and to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. You will remember that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus had made a promise to his disciples as they were to wait in Jerusalem. And he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what was this power to be for? And he says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what we find is we read, we get into chapter 2, and what happens? The Holy Spirit comes in power and the people begin to witness. Peter preaches a sermon and the power of God comes and works through him as he preaches Christ. And what happens is 3,000 people are swept into the kingdom of God, are saved, have their lives changed for time and for all eternity. And this gospel was to be proclaimed in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what we find as we go in through chapters 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 is that the gospel is proclaimed in Jerusalem. And yet it hasn't really gone forth from there. Very little work has been done outside of Jerusalem. And so what does God do? Well, after Stephen has been martyred, God allows Saul of Tarsus to be enraged against the church. As he sees Stephen martyred, he becomes incessant and and, and, an enemy of God and decides to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. And it looks like then the work of God would be thwarted, but actually God and his sovereignty is actually working to accomplish his work in this persecution. Because what happens when the church is persecuted? Well, we read in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Notice what happens. Acts 8 and verse 1, it says, Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. It was still in Jerusalem. And then it says, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Scattered because God wanted his gospel to go out to the nations. We were to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because Jesus Christ purchased men for God from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. And so God wouldn't let them stay in Jerusalem, but he scattered them through this persecution. What did they do when they were scattered and they left Jerusalem? Well, they did the same thing they were doing in Jerusalem. Notice verse 4. It says there, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And was Christ only able to save in Jerusalem? No. Through the preaching of the word, what we find in verses 5 to 25 is that many in Samaria are saved. A church is planted. The Jerusalem church hears about this, sends some of the apostles down to begin to minister, to establish this church in the faith, to begin to teach these new believers. And then as they had accomplished that work and were going to go back to Jerusalem, what did they do on their way back? Well, notice what it says in verse 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Preaching the gospel in Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in Samaria, preaching the gospel in many of the villages. And this is what the early church did. They were focused on this. They testified, they spoke the word of the Lord. They proclaimed Jesus the Christ. This was the program. This was the business of the church. And that is why she made such an impact on the entire Roman Empire as it got turned upside down and they were accused of being those who turning cities upside down. Because they preached this gospel of Jesus Christ so that men from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation would be brought to know the one who died for them and came to save them. And so therefore it shouldn't surprise us then that when we find here, turn to this account of this Ethiopian eunuch in our text, We meet a man there who's living in darkness apart from Christ. And what we will find is that God sends his man, Philip, to preach the gospel to him so that he too, this Ethiopian, might be saved. And so I want to draw our attention to this account this morning. And here we meet a man then from the nation of Ethiopia who's described as a eunuch. 
We see that he was a successful man. We see that he was an important man. We see that he was a religious man, but that he was an unconverted man. Notice first, he was a successful man. He was an important man. In verse 27, what do we read there? Well, it says then, and he rose, this is Philip, and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, and notice what it says, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He was a court official, someone who was very important in the government of Ethiopia, a right-hand person to the queen, Candace of the Ethiopians, and noticed he had been put in charge of something, in charge of all her money, in charge of all her treasure. Now, you don't put a man in charge of the treasure unless he is trustworthy, unless he is a good moral man, unless you know that he can be entrusted with handling these kind of things. And the one who did this would have been a very respected man. He was a successful man. He was high up in the land of Ethiopia. He might have been, if they had such a thing on the cover of People magazine back then, everybody would have looked at him and thought, you know, here's a man who has arrived. Here's a man who has achieved something in life. Look at him. He would have been applauded. He would have been looked up to by those in his country. And yet what we find is he is there and he's living this successful life. He actually is able to travel. He can afford to travel, take some time off work. He goes all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem and back. And as he's traveling, he's traveling with a chauffeur. He has someone actually driving the chariot. He doesn't have to do it himself because he's sitting there reading the Bible while the chariot is going along. And he can talk to Philip and call him up because he's got someone chauffeuring him around. Now, here is the kind of person that so many people want to be today. They want prominence. They want a position of importance. They want people to look up to them. They want money. They want success. They want all of these things. But the Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The Bible in 1 Timothy speaks of how we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Brothers and sisters, are we out pursuing success? Are we out pursuing the world? Is that our focus? Is that our goal? Are we those who are looked up by, on by the world as successful and good, having accomplished great things, and yet our soul is far from God and is in danger of being cast into an eternal fire for all eternity? This Ethiopian, he was in danger. He was successful, but he was without God and without hope in the world. What would it profit him? Because when death would come knocking on his door, when death comes knocking on your door, all the things that man values, all the things in this world, our reputations, our success, our finances, our other things, all will be gone, and we will be naked and exposed before God to whom we must give an account. What then will all these things profit us? Are you concerned about your soul? Are you converted? Do you know God? This man was not. We see he was successful, he was important, but secondly, we see also that this man was a religious man. Many people think, well, this is the way to get right with God. They look at us this morning, you who are here, and someone might think, well, yes, this man is, is religious, this woman is religious. They go to church, they go and regularly attend, they read their Bibles, they do these things, therefore, they must be okay with God. I may not be, I'm sitting at home, I'm going to watch the football game and other things or whatever, but these people, I think they'll be okay. If there is a God, surely they'll be all right with him. They seem to live a good moral life. They seem to raise their kids well. They read their Bibles, they sing, they go to church. They'll be okay. But what we find here is that this man, although he was a religious man, was not a Christian. He was unconverted. Notice what the text says in verses 27 and 28. We know he's religious. Because this one who is in charge of this Candace's treasury, notice what it says at the end of verse 7, 27. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning, seating in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now this man seems to be a very, very devout man. 
The journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem was not a short one at the time. He couldn't just get on an airplane and drop down that later on that day. This was a great journey that he had to take. He was devout. He was committed to what he believed. And he went all the way there and all the way back to, to worship. Surely this man then must be okay with God if you're willing to do that, to go to such great lengths to worship. And he wasn't wasting his time while he was traveling, as so many do, texting their friends and looking at his cell phone. He was actually in the text of Scripture. He's sitting there in his chariot, and he's reading the Bible. He's devoted to the Scriptures. He's thinking about it. He's wondering about it. He's meditating on it. This man was a very religious man. And yet what we find is as he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53, this man is confused. He doesn't understand what he is reading. When Philip asks him if he understands what he is reading, he says, well, no, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And you might think, well, this man was surely an educated man. Was it a lack of reading skills that made him not understand? Did he not have good reading comprehension? He hadn't done his studies while he was younger? No. The reason this man didn't understand what he was reading is because, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 14, this was true of him. Paul says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man cannot understand the things of God. And the natural man reads his Bible and finds it difficult to understand what all is going on. He may understand a few words here and a phrase there and go, okay, I understand that. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. I get that. But the great sweep of scripture, what is all this about? The natural man cannot figure out because he does not have and possess the spirit of God. If you regularly read your Bible and you look at it and you go, I have no clue what's really going on here. Maybe it's because you are like this man, you are unconverted. Because the converted person, as they read the Bible, they begin to understand the sweep of Scripture as it talks about God, who was our creator, and man, who was created in the image of God and yet fell into sin. And yet God had promised man who had fallen into sin that he would send one to make things right. And the one he sent to make things right was the Lord Jesus Christ, the great Messiah, the Savior, who's talking about in this text from Isaiah chapter 53. But he couldn't see it. He couldn't understand he didn't know because he was still in the darkness. He was still unconverted. And so then, he needs help, help from beyond himself. He regularly worshipped. He regularly attended worship. He regularly read his Bible, and yet he remained blind to the truth of the gospel and remained unconverted apart from Christ, apart from God. And I think there are far too many people in our land today who go to church like this man. He went to Jerusalem blind in his sin, and he was returning the same way. Too many people come to church, and they think that they're doing their duty to God and that they're fine with him, and yet they remain blind to the truth of the gospel, unconverted like this man. And you might think, well, if a man will go all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem and read his Bible incessantly and yet not be converted, how is it that someone can actually be saved? How could maybe you be saved who are here this morning? How were we saved? And what we find is that this text gives us great answers, great help as we think about this. And the first thing that we notice, how is a man or a woman saved? Well, what we find is that Salvation is a work of God. What we find in this text is that conversion is a supernatural work of God. When a person is converted and they begin to look back afterwards and they look back, they begin to see that it was God who was at work. They were blind. They were apart from him. They might have been groping around in the dark, searching, trying to be religious in other things. But then God did something. God began to work in his gracious providence. And we see here that God in his grace begins to work in the life of this Ethiopian eunuch. Notice how he does this in the beginning in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
This is a desert place. What we see here is that God sends an angel. God sends an angel out of heaven to go and speak to his servant Philip so that his servant Philip will go and speak to this Ethiopian eunuch so that he might be saved. Now, some might be here this morning and go, well, that's a little bit far-fetched, this talk of angels and other things and everything else. I, I recognize, you know, that, that some people might be spiritual, but I am a really a, a naturalist. I believe in nature and science and things that I can touch and feel and this kind of thing. I know this chair is here, but all this talk about angels and cherubim and other things or whatever and a God that I can't see, this I can't really believe. And yet, brothers and sisters, I declare to you today that there is not a, all that we see is not all there is. There is a God, an unseen God, who created all things that are seen out of nothing by the word of his power. And part of those whom he created were angels, cherubim, and seraphim, spiritual beings that exist and actually that are here with us this morning, even though we cannot see them. The writer to the Hebrews would tell the people that they were to show hospitality, and one of the reasons that they would show hospitality was because sometimes they might be entertaining angels unaware. The writer to the Hebrews also tells us that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve on behalf of those who are to inherit salvation. That's what's happening with this angel here. There was one who was to inherit salvation. He was a servant sent on his behalf tells Philip to go, and Philip then hears, and he tells him of a particular place and a particular road that he is to go to. Because God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved this Ethiopian eunuch, intended to make him alive together with Christ. And by grace, he intended to save him. This was going to be a work that God initiated. God was at work. And notice in verse 29, this work of God continues it says there in verse 29, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So an angel directs him to the right road in the right place, and then the Spirit of God tells him to go to a particular chariot and a particular person. And you might say, well, is that how everybody is expected to be converted today? If you say it is a supernatural work of God, are we to wait for angels to talk to us? Are we to wait for the Spirit to tell us? Well, I would say to you this morning that if you are converted, it was entirely initiated by a supernatural work of God. You say, but I was born in a Christian home and I didn't hear any voices or see any angels exactly. It's God who knit you together in your mother's womb. It's God who allowed you to live at such a time as this where the scriptures are there for us to read and to know and to understand where they are preached and proclaimed throughout our country. God allowed you to be born in such a time and place as this so that you could, through various means, through parents and others and teachers and preachers, come to know the truth of God and so be saved. Every salvation is a supernatural work of God initiated by God so that the hymn writer could say, I sought the Lord. And that's true. The Ethiopian eunuch was seeking the Lord. But it says, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew. He moved my soul to seek him seeking me. It was not I that found, O Savior, true, but I was found of thee. This is the Ethiopian's testimony. This will be the testimony of all that truly God did a work. It's plain that God was seeking this Ethiopian eunuch. People today talk about having seeker-sensitive church services. As if men are seeking after God and we need to make the service some way so that they feel comfortable, that they'll feel happy, and maybe they'll stay. But the truly seeker-sensitive worship service is one who is seeker-sensitive to the seeker, which is God himself. God himself is the one who seeks and saves those who are lost. We need to be sensitive to him. God sent the angel, did he not? I'm, not? I'm not pulling a rabbit out of a hat. He sent the angel, he sent Philip, he sent the spirit so that this lost man might be saved. Conversion is a work of God. And while this is true, what we find is that God does the work, but God also uses means. God also uses means by which he accomplishes this work. It is God who is working, but God uses means. 
It's like the man who owned and bought this great island out in the middle of the ocean. And he had this island and he was rejoicing in it and he looked at it, but it was very undeveloped. And he thought this could be a very beautiful place. And he could build a home on it and he could build beautiful gardens and have this great place to go on his vacation. And so what he did is he sought out the best gardener he could possibly find a world-renowned gardener, and he brought him to the island, and he brought him over there on his helicopter and dropped him down there, and he said, look, I'm going to leave you here for a month. I'm going away on business, and when I come back, I just want to see what you will do with all of this place and turn it into a beautiful garden paradise that I can enjoy. And so the man went away, and a month later, he came back, and he looked around his island, and very little had been done at all. And he finally found the man and he says, look, I thought you were this great gardener. I'd heard all about your fame and everything else. I thought you could do this and look, you've hardly done anything. And the gardener says to him, he says, well, by the way, you forgot to send the helicopter back with all my tools. And so I had nothing to work with. You see, it's the gardener who does the work, but he does the work through the tools. And so it is with God. God is the one who saves, but he uses means by which he accomplishes that salvation. And here we see two of the great means that God uses in our text. First, God uses men and women. God uses ordinary men and women to proclaim his gospel so that men and women might be saved. You think about this. Why use a middleman? Why does the angel come to Philip in the first place? Why doesn't he just go to the Ethiopian eunuch and tell him himself? Surely it would have been easier, but no, now Philip has to go out of his way. He could have left him at his church plant teaching and preaching and these things and left him there, but God calls Philip to go and go from the north all the way down to the south to go to this obscure road when the angel could have just gone there himself and just skipped all this process. But it is regularly seen throughout the scriptures that God, although he could use angels and others to accomplish this purpose, uses humble, weak vessels like you and me. We see this regularly. We find, for instance, in Acts and chapter 11. In Acts and chapter 11, the apostle Peter is recounting what happened at Cornelius' house. He was giving an account of the events that had led up to the conversion of Cornelius and those at his house. In Acts 11, in the second half of chapter, verse 12, it says this. Peter says, we entered this man's house. And then in verse 13, what happened? He said, and this man told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. Again, an angel appears, but he calls him to send for Simon, who is called Peter, because God doesn't use angels to bring his gospel, but he has commissioned men and women like you and I. You say, well, that's a fairly flimsy means to trust in. God entrust this to you and me so that he alone will get the glory. Frail vessels like me preaching this gospel so that we would know that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. If you regularly would talk to me, you regularly recognize I, I'm not the, the, the brightest bulb in the bunch. I, I'm not the, the greatest orator on earth. The only way anything will get accomplished here this morning is if God and his spirit accomplishes it through a weak vessel like me in the hearts and lives of people so that you will not boast in the person, but you will boast in the Lord who works through the person. This is the means. And so it was with Philip. He was called by an angel to leave Samaria and to go because God was at work. God was sending one of his servants to be the means by which this prominent Ethiopian might be converted and be saved. The Great Commission, brothers and sisters, will not be accomplished by those who will not go, but those who will not be willing to be used of God. If men are to be saved, men and women must go forth and proclaim this gospel. This is the great need in our country today for men and women who will not just sit in church on Sunday, but will go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in, who will preach the good news. You say, I'm not qualified. Therefore, then I say, you are qualified. The only person who's really qualified to preach this gospel is the one who recognizes that he cannot do it by himself. It is a work that God does through individuals. It's he who accomplishes the work through weak means like you and I. And so we see one of the means God uses is people like Philip and Peter and you and I, but God also uses another means, a very important one. He uses his word. 
and particularly the word of the cross, the preaching of the gospel. Now, if you look back in Acts chapter 11, in Acts chapter 11, after this man is commanded to send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter, notice what comes next in verse 14. Why, what is Peter going to do? What is he going to accomplish? Well, in verse 14 of Acts chapter 11, it says this, send to Joppa, bring Simon, who is called Peter, for he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved you and all your household. Go get Peter, because he's going to be the instrument, he's going to be the means by which he's going to declare to you a message, and after he declares the message, you will be saved. This is a work of God, but he uses means. He uses men proclaiming a message. Peter was the man to declare the message in that case, Philip in the other case. This Ethiopian eunuch was going to become saved because God was going to use his man and his word to accomplish the task. Notice that the Ethiopian eunuch is reading God's word. He's reading from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. And you find that he is reading and he is thinking, he is meditating, but he is not understanding. And the Spirit of God sends Philip just at the right time. You can imagine the, the eunuch looking and seeing this guy running beside his chariot and wonder what the heck is going on. Is he going to, you know, kind of come with a gun and pull him over and try to steal his stuff? Like, who is this guy and what is he doing and why is he running up to my chariot? But as Philip is running along and he's listening and he hears him reading from the prophet Isaiah from chapter 53, and he asks him, as he's running along, he says, do you, do you understand what you are reading, sir? And he says, how can I unless someone explains it to me, unless someone guides me? And then, after he calls Philip up into the chariot, he gets comfortable. The eunuch says to Philip in verse 34, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Now, I don't know about you, but very rarely do we find opportunities to speak of the gospel of Jesus Christ that are teed up in such a way as this. God and his providence was at work in all of this. At just the right time, he's reading just the right passage. He's asking just the right questions. And then the Spirit of God sends Philip there to explain to him what is going on in this text. And it says in verse 35, Then Philip, who had been prepared by God, who had been saved by God, who was full of the Spirit of God and wisdom, begins with this scripture to tell him the good news about Jesus. And brothers and sisters, I say to you this morning that there will be no one who will be saved apart from the Word of God, apart from the preaching of this gospel. There was a quote that was attributed to St. Francis of Assisi that was said to preach the gospel and, if necessary, use words. That is a direct contradiction to everything we read in the Bible. The only way we can preach the gospel is through words. It is through words that God brings people to saving faith in Christ. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, James 1.18. Or you may remember the Apostle Paul's great logic in Romans in chapter 10, as he says in verse 13, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then he deduces this as he goes along. He says, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And then he finally goes on to say in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So God calls and sends Philip so that he, this one who is sent to preach, could preach and teach the good news about Jesus Christ so that the Ethiopian eunuch could hear, so that he could believe, so that he could call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. God is the one who initiates and brings about the salvation of sinners, but he does it through means, through men, through the preaching of his word. Philip opened his mouth, 
and with this scripture told them the good news about Jesus Christ. Are we prepared to do that this morning? If you are a Christian, you are called to present the good news about Jesus Christ. If you had the opportunity, could you begin from Isaiah 53 and share the gospel with someone? If you met a Jew on the road who was reading Isaiah 53, could you tell him the good news about Christ? For this is the good news that everyone needs to hear, not the things we find given to us by our news media. It is this news that is so necessary for the conversion of sinners that they might come to be reconciled to God. We must preach Christ and him crucified. Philip knew this. He understood. He could begin from the Old Testament scriptures. Why? Because he understood what we had memorized a number of months back. You remember Luke in chapter 24 and verse 44. That comes in handy when we understand it and actually can apply it. When Jesus said to his disciples, this is what I said to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets like Isaiah in 53 and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened his disciples' minds to understand the scriptures. This is exactly now what Philip will do here. He will begin to show him how Christ is the one who is spoken of here in the prophets, in Isaiah, and he will open his mind as the Spirit of God works through his word to understand the scriptures so that he might be saved. He might have said, as the text talks about here, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And the man says, who is he speaking of? Is the prophet speaking of himself or someone else? Who is the he? And he would have said, it is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, who is being spoken of here, it is Jesus. Jesus was led to the slaughter, and the Ethiopian eunuch might have asked, well, why? Why was Jesus, the Son of God, why was he slaughtered in this way on a Roman cross? And Philip might have said, because you and I deserve to be slaughtered. You and I deserve the curse of God that he bore on that tree at Calvary. Jesus Christ came as a substitute for sinners. He might have said, you remember, if you read about the Passover lamb in the Old Testament that was sacrificed and the blood put on the doorposts so that the people could be saved from the wrath of God that came on those in Egypt. Do you remember the one that was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement and the blood was taken in and put on the mercy seat? to atone for the sins of Israel? Do you remember the ram that was caught in the thicket? Do you remember reading about that in in Isaac's day and how it was substituted for Isaac and was killed in his place? This is what is going on here. It was prophesying that 800 years after, which now had been fulfilled, that God was going to send his son as a lamb to the slaughter to die in the place of sinners, so that through faith in him, those who believe on this substitute would be forgiven of their sin and not bear the wrath and judgment of God that this slaughter pictures and represents. He might have gone on, and in the next verse it says, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. He would have said, well, who is this speaking of? And he would say, Jesus. Jesus, falsely accused, falsely tried, falsely condemned, falsely murdered, justice was denied him. Why would God allow such a thing? Because God's justice demanded that someone bear the punishment for sins. And if sinners were going to be saved from their sins and be declared righteous and just before God, he sent his son to do this very thing, to bear the just punishment of God, So that while men carried out an injustice, God exacted his justice on his son, punishing him in the stead of you and I. So that when we face God one day at the judgment seat of God at that great white throne, we wouldn't have to feel and be condemned under this. But because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we would stand there just, righteous, forgiven by God because Jesus Christ was denied justice. Justice was satisfied so that you and I would no longer have to fear the justice of God. And finally, it talks about how one whose life was taken away. And he would have said, yes, Jesus' life was taken away. Because the wages of sin is death. 
He would have told the Ethiopian eunuch, all your worship, all your Bible reading, none of this could accomplish salvation, but God sent his son in your stead to die in the place of sinners and to rise again from the dead. And now he has ascended into heaven and calls you to trust in him, to believe on him, to turn from your sin and believe in him. And through him, you can be granted everlasting life so that though you would die, yet you would live. This is the gospel that we have to proclaim, and I proclaim to you this morning. The Bible says that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Your entire life could be changed, your entire eternity today, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what happened to this man. Because what we see is that as as somehow as Philip was sharing the gospel with him, the Spirit of God did a work, and this man then was born again. This man was converted. Now you might say, well, how do I know this? Where do I see this in the text? Well, here we have some examples of true conversion, evidence of true conversion, that this eunuch had experienced the power of God in his life. You may be in church this morning, but I ask you, are you converted? Has God done a work in your heart and life? Well, what are some of the evidence of this? Well, first of all, we see that his life was marked by a desire to obey God. Notice verse 36 through 38. He goes on, he says, Then Philip opened his mouth, in verse 35, and beginning with this scripture, told them the good news about Jesus. And then, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. You may remember the Great Commission when the Lord Jesus commissioned his disciples and said they were to go into all the world making disciples of all nations like this eunuch, and they were to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and then teach them to obey or observe all that Christ had commanded. And the first command that Philip would have been told to the Ethiopian eunuch was that he was to believe, and then in belief he was to be baptized. He was to obey the command to be baptized, and here this man didn't want to wait a moment. He was going to Ethiopia. There would be no one there to baptize him, and so he says to Philip, look, I see some water here, and he stops the chariot and commands that it stop so that he could be baptized. What's to keep me from doing this? And so we see that he has a great desire to obey God. He wants to do what Christ has commanded. Those who are truly converted then turn from their sin and begin to want to follow after the commands of God, to obey what he has said. They don't do it perfectly, but there is a hunger and a desire to follow after God and his word. Secondly, we notice, and here, just a brief note, there is in the ESV and many other translations, if you'll notice, there is a verse 36, there is a verse 38, and then there is a footnote for verse 37. Some translations include this and some do not. That is because some of the most the reliable manuscripts include it and others do not. And so there is some question as to whether this is included in the text. But I point out, and it's written here at the bottom in your ESV, under point number two at the bottom, it says, some manuscripts add all or most of the following. And it says, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may, after he had asked to be baptized. And then the eunuch replied, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, whether a translation has that text or doesn't have that text matters not at all to me at this point in time. It does matter. But for the sake of what we are saying here, what I can say is that every single converted person, whether it's in this text or not, will profess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. There is a profession of faith. There is a profession of belief. There is a profession that once someone comes to know the truth about Christ, it says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so it is that this Ethiopian eunuch, he comes to want to obey Christ in baptism. He would proclaim Christ as Lord. Whether it's in this text or not, this would have been the truth of him. He would have gone back to Ethiopia proclaiming this very thing, that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. 
All true converts will proclaim this. Thirdly, notice another mark of conversion in verse 39. It says, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Rejoicing. Someone who has been brought out of darkness into the marvelous light of God. Someone who has been saved from the eternal judgment and wrath of God and given everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. I think it would be safe to say that he will feel some sense of joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love and it is joy. Joy as the Spirit of God came to live in him. Joy as he came to understand what Christ had done for him. Joy to understand that he was under no longer under condemnation. His conscience was cleansed and he now had trusted in Christ for his salvation. He rejoiced. He went on his way rejoicing. This is again a mark of a true convert. And finally, his life would be marked by perseverance. His life was going to be marked by the perseverance of the saints. This man would persevere in the faith. Now you say, where do I find this in the text? Well, notice what happens in verse 39 and 40. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now, you still may be confused, but I find it in this. The Spirit of God took Philip away. Think about this for a moment. This man has just been converted. He's just been baptized. Is this the kind of thing that you and I would do? Do we leave a, a newly converted person and not send Philip along the way with him to spend some time to teach him, to disciple him. Surely he's going to fall away from the faith. Surely he will lose what he has come to believe in. Is this the case? No, the Spirit of God knows that when God does a work in the heart and life of a person, that he who began a good work in that person will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. When someone is truly saved, when they have come to be born again, the Bible says that he who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And what God has made a new creation, no one can undo. When someone has been born again, they cannot be unborn again. When God does a work, he will continue that work. When the Spirit of God comes to indwell a believer, he can keep them, he can help them, he can hold them. No one can snatch them out of Christ's hand, the Lord Jesus Christ says. Jude says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. God is able to finish what he started. When he does a true work of salvation, that work will continue. So I ask you this morning, in light of what we have read, are you converted? Do you long to obey the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you long to follow after him? Do you love to profess that he is Lord and God? Do you have a joy in your heart when you read the scriptures? Has your mind been opened? Do you actually understand them when you read? And do you find yourself, although at times battered, by the world, the flesh, and the devil, continuing to persevere in the faith, growing in Christ until the day when he comes again. Brothers and sisters, you may go out from this place and the world may think much of you because you are successful, because you have a position of prominence, but is your soul in the hands of God? Have you turned to Christ? You may come back and be religious week after week, reading your Bibles and regularly attending church. But have you been saved? Have you been made new in Christ? This here is what all of us need to ask, and we need to turn to God. If you have doubts, if you have questions, turn to God and say, Oh God, just as you went and sent Philip and did this work in the life of this eunuch, so come and do it in me. Make me a new creature. Do a work in my heart. Turn me to you. Make me a new creation in Christ. Oh God, I've tried to save myself. I've tried through my works to make myself right with you. I fail miserably. Please come and save me by your grace and mercy, even this morning. I pray that there would be none here 
who would not know the Lord Jesus Christ, have not come and come to know his saving work, and that would go out from this place, then willing and ready like Philip to go and proclaim this good news to others. Let's turn to our God and let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of grace and mercy, a God who comes seeking and saving those who are lost, a God who does a work in our lives that we could not do ourselves, one who takes those who are dead in sins and makes them alive together with Christ. And Lord, we pray that this converting work that happened in the life of this Ethiopian would happen across our land and across our country, Lord, across our city and throughout the nations, that you would continue to call to yourself, Lord, through your people, through the proclamation of your word, those who would come to believe on Christ, to follow him, to rejoice in him, and to continue to follow him faithfully until he comes. We pray, O oh God, that you would multiply this work in our land. O oh Lord, we long to plant, we long to water, but only you can make it grow. May you use us, O oh Lord, and may you graciously save some even here this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.